Hey guys, and thanks for joining us at I-80 Sports today. We are previewing the 2021 season for Sporting KC. Like we're doing with all our MLS season previews, we're bringing on an expert, a specialist for Sporting KC. Why don't you take some time to introduce yourself and let us know what you're doing? Sure. Thank you guys for having me. My name is Jimmy Mack. I am the co-host of No Other Pod, which is a Sporting KC and MLS podcast. We're based out of Kansas City, and we cover Sporting Kansas City, obviously. Uh, we've been going for just about four years now. We uh, we started, uh, I think our first episode was the week after the 2017 U.S. Open Cup Championship win, and uh, we've been going strong ever since. So yeah, you can check us out at No Other Pod on Twitter or anywhere you can get your podcasts. And uh, Thank you guys so much for having me. I love talking sport in KC. Absolutely. We'll have all those links below for you guys. Really easy to set up. So we want to get into, you know, first an overview, a little bit about the ownership, stadium, culture, history. Why don't you take us there and let us know really what's special about Sporting Kansas City? Sure. So Sporting Kansas City, uh, as, as many of your listeners probably know, we're one of the original Major League Soccer clubs, uh, but they obviously weren't always called Sporting Kansas City. They were the Kansas City Wiz for the first year, then became which, the Kansas which, City. Which we need to stop right there because that is <laughs> some lame stuff, man. I, I don't know if I could have gotten on board. Well, you, you know, not many people in Kansas City got on board either. <laughs> so there Fair was enough. there was a reason after a year they went from the Kansas City Wiz to the Kansas City Wizards and thought that that was going to be the key to fixing all of their branding problems. And uh, they, they, they stuck with the rainbow motif that they had going for a while. And I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So they had all the rainbow jerseys and they're like, OK, well, maybe it's maybe that's not the best. So we're going to switch to more of like it was like a royal blue and yellow type of motif. But they're still a the Kansas City Wizards look maybe a little bit more professional, but Still wasn't really clicking. And then uh, was it 2009, 2010, that's when they underwent the rebrand to, to Sporting Kansas City. I think it was 2009, the new ownership group bought the club. And then 2010 was when they unveiled unveiled the uh, the new branding of, of Sporting Kansas City. And ironically, when they unveiled the new brand, people weren't in love with the name. It, it felt a little bit more like, oh, this is just a, another Euro copy name. Even though there wasn't a Sporting yet in MLS, they, you had all the, the Inter, United. Inter, SC, and, FC, all the stuff that we hear every time a new club is announced. One thing really interesting, uh, this club was owned by Lamar Hunt and the Hunt Sports Group, who had a huge uh, impact on early MLS. Now, obviously, we have the Lamar Open Cup, which which is named after him. Um, mm -hmm. So... SKC is, is absolutely pivotal in, in the development of MLS, uh, even through the early financial troubles, one mm -hmm. of the original clubs there. Um, absolutely. What about the stadium, um, culture, supporters groups? Do you want to just weigh in just for a minute on on those? Sure. And so really when, when things turned around, it was with the rebrand. That was when they, they, they changed to Sporting Kansas City. That's when they started building what was then called uh, Live Strong Park and then they disassociated from Livestrong, uh, became Sporting Park for a long time. Now it's Children's Mercy Park, which is a local children's hospital they have a partnership with here. It seats about 20,000 fans. Uh, it's known as the Blue Hell for people who come. The, the, the Kansas City Cauldron is the main supporters group. And then there's the South Stand, which is the, the supporters group on the opposite side of the, of the stadium. Uh, it's it's a party. I mean, I'm sure you guys have been to many yeah. a soccer game where you know, you know what soccer supporter culture is like. And uh, the cauldron is, is no different. They they love their beer. They love their parties. They love their chance. Uh, it, it, it's a fun time. Uh, Sporting Kansas City had a, a run of about 170 straight sellout games, and that started post-rebrand. Uh, and really, throughout their entire run of Sporting Kansas City, it's been sellout after sellout after sellout. And, and, and they have – I would say it's still one of the premier stadiums in MLS, even though – it's starting to get a little on the smaller side. It's about 10 years old now. And when, when there's all these big, you know, uh, Audi field that DC United has, uh, you know, uh, Allianz field in Minnesota, yeah, FC yeah. Cincy's new stadium. They're, they're really, those are the state of the art stadiums now, but children's mercy park still holds up. And, and SKC fans, um, they, the one thing that SKC has done really well with the culture is not just tap into soccer supporter culture, but they've really tapped into a love of Kansas City as a community. And I think that's what the biggest difference between when they were the Kansas City Wizards, where they were sort of trying to market to like soccer family, soccer moms. Yeah, they've really flipped it. So now like, it's the cool thing to love Kansas City. And if you love Kansas City, you're gonna love sporting Kansas City because they've done a, such a good job connecting the culture and the brand. Love it. Good stuff. Let's move on and talk yeah. a little bit about last season. We'll have only time for just a quick recap. 
Sporting KC went 12, 6, and 3 with 38 goals and conceded only 25. That 39 points put them first in the West. You had Alan Polito, six goals, five assists, and only 11 starts. Gadi Kinda, six goals, four assists. Johnny Russell, six goals, four assists. Kiri Shelton and Eric Hurtado with five goals each. So we'll talk just briefly. What happened last season? Uh, how did we get to where we are? Yeah, so obviously with 2020 being the weird year that it was, uh, Sporting Kansas City on paper had a pretty good year, decent amount of goals, uh, pretty decent defense again on paper. The, the the biggest question for Sporting KC fans going into the playoffs, obviously we finished first place in the West, was is this the real deal or is this a product of the teams that we played? We didn't play Seattle, we didn't play LAFC, we didn't play Portland because of the the geographic scheduling. And uh, Alan Polito, he was injured going into the playoffs, and that's why he only had 11 starts last year. He, he had some some knocks, although yeah, that hurt. 11 goals plus assists and 11 starts, that's a pretty good clip. Uh, if, if you extrapolate that out to a full season, that's living up to that $9 million price tag that sort yeah. of broke the yeah, record for, sure. for Sporting KC. Uh, and then Gadi Kinda, he was the other the, the, the big-time addition. He became a permanent addition this offseason. He's really a, a hybrid number eight, number 10 sort of a creative spark in the midfield, more of a creative spark that SKC has had really since uh, Benny Fellhaber. Um, Felipe Gutierrez kind of filled that role, but he had injury issues, couldn't play last year, and is no longer with the team. The uh, You know, what happened was we got into the playoffs, and, and maybe SKC couldn't quite live up to the first place in the West because we hadn't been tested against the Seattle Sounders. So, you know, it, it is what it is, and, and the team has – I wouldn't say they've rebuilt in the off season, but there's been definitely some turnover. It's almost like a, a, a refresh, not a full rebuild, but uh, there's, there's some, some new players along the front line, especially in terms of depth. Uh, there's going to be new players along the back line and, and it's going to be, you know, sort of the beginning of a new era for sporting Kansas city. Absolutely. Now, Alex, I know you love watching them in play in the playoffs. They were one team that we hey. predicted every single week. Um, they got Reynoso in the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, you know, you know my thoughts are Reynoso, but the, Tim Mealy, the game before it against San Jose, what a game that was! You know, Buzio scoring in the ninety-something minute, you think they win, and then Wando gets a goal in ninety-seventh minute. Yeah. I mean, and then Tim Mealy, I mean, this guy is just so underrated. What he does in penalty kicks over his career, I mean, it, it, I don't think it gets talked enough, and it, he just makes Sporty Kansas City that much solid in the back. I mean, they may not have the best defenders in the back. When you only got Tim Mealy there, you're in for a tough time every time, you, especially when you go into Sporty Kansas City. And like you mentioned before, once Polito wasn't going to play against Minnesota, Minnesota was hot. Reynoso was on fire. I mean, he just ran out of gas. I really think if Polito was healthy in that game, that game, the, the 3 nothing score is, would not be the same score Polito was playing in that game. And it was just, you know, just you just ran out of gas to me. That's the way, as an outsider, is the way I look at it as. So, All right, so just, one of the reasons for the success around Sporting Kansas City is coach uh, Peter Ver Vermes, who means a lot to the team. He played for the Wizards, and he, as a coach, won 2013 MLS Cup, won U.S. Open Cup three times in 2012, 2015, and 2017. Let's talk a little bit about coach Peter Vermes and what he means to this squad. Yeah, I mean, he's the longest tenured coach in MLS. Uh, he's the only coach in MLS history to win an MLS Cup as a player and a coach with the same club. Uh, he not only is the coach, he's the technical director. He has total control over the roster, uh, and he has a very clear vision of what he wants in terms of style of play, in terms of an academy pipeline. They've built uh, Sporting Kansas City 2. They were the Swope Park Rangers, and now they're Sporting Kansas City 2. They built that for the sole purpose of essentially being the farm team for SKC and where he can send players who he wants to be first team players, but aren't getting consistent minutes. So they can go down there mirror the senior roster style and really get more on the field minutes and competitive action. And so the thing about him is, you know, every game he's going to come out in his four, three, three formation. Uh, the fullbacks are going to press up high. The wings are going to cut in. He likes playing uh, opposite footed on the wing. So Johnny Russell is actually a left footer winger, but he plays on the right side because he likes him to cut in and shoot, yeah. uh, uh, cutting in uh it's it's a high press the line when when the back line when skc's on defense is pushing up to about the midline uh it, it's it's a very uh you could say it's a high risk high rewards style of play and and that's almost what bit them a little bit again even though we only conceded 25 goals last year some of the goals they did concede were if the back line's not in lockstep as far as making sure that you're not holding a, a, a guy on side. That's what bit us a few times last year. Poonchech was a step off or uh, um, Beasler or Winston Reed was a step off. And, and then you get burned with these uh, balls that really should have been offside. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, 
you know what you're going to get with Sporting KC, which is a blessing and a curse because when they're firing on all cylinders, it's an incredibly hard style of soccer to defend against. But if if they can't really break down the defense and they just start whipping and crosses, it gets really frustrating as an SKC fan because that's when they'll start firing in shots from outside the box and you get the stat lines where SKC took 27 shots in a game, but two of them were on target. Yeah, it looks, it looks like a hockey uh, goal line when, when, when you see that come up. Right. Uh, great stuff. Let's talk a little bit about the players because that is what we're here to preview for the 2021 season. There were some changes. I'm going to bring up what I think is going to be similar to what you might see as a starting 11. I know where there's a couple areas where me and you disagree just a little bit, but we're going to bring this graphic up. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see if you're uh, at home listening on one of our podcasts, uh, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll lay it out for you. Striker Alan Polito, that's set in stone. They paid this guy more than uh, anyone else in club history in a transfer fee to come over. Then we have two wingers, very important to the Sporting Kansas City system. On the left, you have either Kiri Shelton or Shallowy, Shallowy, excuse me. Um, and on the right, you have Johnny Russell. In midfield, there are really five players we're going to break down a little bit that we can talk, can kind of all play in different positions with Gianluca Busio, Gadi Kinda, Remy Walter, Ilya Sanchez, and Roger Espinoza. In the back line, you have Dia and Lindsay on the outside with three center backs. Uh, Puncic, Ismat Mirin, Isimat Mirin, I believe that is close <laughs> to being pronounced correctly, and, and uh, Fontas, and then Tim Melia in net that seems to be what we're working with let's just start with attackers because we already mentioned it alan polito johnny russell that's a potent one two combo i absolutely love alan polito uh he came in he did what he was meant to do he battled injury all last season but five six goals five assists in 11 games we already said that's a, an amazing stat line and it's over enough of a sample size it's not like it's two games it's 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 a it's an experience in MLS that he he's put up and a stat that I pulled up Sporting Kansas City was seven two and zero and score and earned twenty one of twenty seven possible points in games where he scored or got an assist that is seven two and zero oh. that is a great record and that just shows how important his his he is for this sporting attack. Yeah, absolutely. He he is. He, I mean. He's the the record for a Sporting Kansas City signing uh, signing reported between nine and ten and a half million dollars. He's the the designated player striker that SKC fans have been asking for ever since the Dom Dwyer trade, you know, four years ago. Uh, he is. I mean, if he's healthy, he's a fifteen to twenty goal a year guy, probably right, adding right. another eight to ten assists there. Uh, he he is the Sporting Kansas City attack. Uh, you know, obviously Johnny Russell is very talented. Gadi Kinda is very talented. What Alan Polito does is he opens up the space for them. Johnny Russell loves cutting inside. He loves trying to split defenders, but people got used to him doing that, so they adjusted. But you can't send two defenders over to defend against Johnny Russell and leave Alan Polito by himself in the middle of the field at the six-yard box. So when Polito's in there, not only is he great finishing the ball himself and he's got fantastic hold-up play, he creates space for all the other attackers around him. The question that SKC fans have had all year is the left wing spot because that wasn't consistent last year. Gerso Fernandez was the player who probably most consistently got the start there alongside with Kyrie Shelton, but Gerso's gone. Daniel Shallowy had a great 2018, although if you look at the advanced stats from 2018, he far outperformed his expected goals. And then he not only came back to earth, he like, fell through the earth in the last couple of years and, and has not been able to reproduce it. He had one goal in 2019 and he played all of about 120 minutes in 2020. He's really fallen out of favor. So a lot of people project Kyrie Shelton sort of by default is going to be starting on that left wing, especially since Kyrie came back from Germany. He's looked a different player. Now there's possibility that Gianluca Buzio could get some time on the left wing too. That's been talked about, but that left wing spot is really the biggest question mark right now on the front line. I love Shallowy, just his, his body of work so far. Maybe I am still thinking about two years ago, but in uh, he only had one goal and two assists uh, sin since that 2018 season over the last uh, season and a half. He has not reclaimed starter form. I think he's only started maybe half the games he's been in um, over the last two years, especially uh, two years ago. So if he can regain form and be that other winger, which is where I'm favoring. That's where our we're just a little bit off. I like Shallowy. I think you like Kiri Shelton to, to take that spot. And hey, 
Kerry Shelton came out and, and he he contributed last season. So I, I think mm-hmm. they're, they're all going to be there. And when we talk about those spots, it's not going to be set in stone. There's a lot of games to be played this season, and we'll see a little bit of everyone, a little bit of everywhere. And when I think of that uh, movement from game to game, I, I think about the midfield because that's where we really have guys, five guys who are starting caliber MLS players on any team in this league all playing together. We have, um, again, Gianluca Busio, kind of the, the wonder kid, you know, everyone loves him, U.S. men's national team player. Um, they got Gadi Kinda and Ilya Sanchez. Now, uh, Kinda had an amazing year last year, kind of his coming out party, if you will. But then you have Roger Espinosa, Ilya Sanchez, and the new player, Remy Walter, all kind of vying for that third spot. How do you see the breakdown, and who who would you see on the best starting 11? Who do you see as maybe a fill-in Wednesday night game player out of that group? That's a tough question, man, because like you said, they're all five arguably starting caliber players on an MLS team. Uh, the 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 I, If you were going to say there's an odd man out, quote unquote, I would say I'd lean toward Roger Espinosa just because he's 34, I think, pushing 35 years old now. He's just, you know, especially the style of play he has. He's such a high motor physical player. He's just not going to be a 90 minute game in game out guy. But if you can bring him off the bench for 30 minutes and start wrecking the midfield, that's a real good thing to have. Uh, Gianluca Buzio, he's the young 18-year-old that has drawn attention from Juventus, Milan, uh, European sides, especially in Italy. Uh, he was just given the number 10 this offseason. Now, Sporting KC doesn't play really with a traditional number 10 in the sense of you know that center attacking midfielder. It's more dual number eights, but still, that's a symbolic gesture. Peter Vermees trusts Gianluca Buzio to really take that next step and maybe earn that $10 million price tag that Sporting KC has put on his head for a European transfer. I agree there. And one thing that I really like about the fact that he got that number, I think it's less telling of the position or the style of play and more telling that he is in the long term plans of the club. He is young. He still has a little growing to do. But I think that that gesture of giving the number 10 is like saying, we have faith. We know you're going to be that guy. We know you're going to be playing a lot of minutes this year. So here's a number on the back of your jersey. And we're going to get more than $10 million from him if you keep doing what you're doing. I think that's the key <laughs> right here. If he keeps doing what he's doing, you're going to get more than $10 million from him. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah, and, and it's an interesting story how he got it. I'll just say real quick because I know we're short on time. Is he was telling some players in the locker room, I guess, he's like, I think I kind of want the number 10 because nobody had it since Felipe Gutierrez was injured and then left the club this offseason. And they're like, well, tell Peter. So I guess he went to Peter. He's like, Peter, I think I want the number 10. And Peter like really grilled him. And quite, he's like, do you think you're ready? This is what this means. This is the history. Like basically took him through like, this is what this means. And he, still the 18 year old was like, give it to me. I want it. And Peter was like, okay. And Peter trusted him enough to do it. So Peter wouldn't have given it to him if he didn't think he could deserve it. So it's a, it's, it's a, a, a big boost of confidence from Peter and, and a sign of the confidence that Buzio has himself. Now the, the, the question is, the number eight and the number six spot, uh, it's certainly going to be Gadi Kinda in one of those spots, probably. Uh, Gianluca Buzio, if he's not on the left wing, he's probably in the other spot. Remy Walter is a player they just signed, as you mentioned. He's a, he's a French player. Uh, they really like him. They initially brought him in maybe to challenge Ilya for the number six spot, but now they think he's probably going to stay more as the number eight. So he'll be in a rotation sort of alongside Buzio and Gadi Kinda, and that probably means Ilya is, Ilya is starting as the number six but it's certainly possible that Walter could slide back into that number six role or Gianluca Buzio. Again, he played a number of games last year in that number six spot, sort of in that, uh, they, uh, it, this kind of got blown out of proportion, but Peter Vermees likened him to an Andrea Pirlo type number six, where he's, he's an attacking minded player. He's got very good uh, field vision, can pass the ball very well. And he did pretty well at the number six, even though it wasn't his natural spot. So you could even see Buzio at the six with Kinda and Walter as sort of dual number eights. Absolutely. Walter's a player that I really want to talk about just for a minute. Remy Walter coming from France. He uh, is only 24 years old, been playing pro uh, in the uh, second league in France with Nancy uh, since he was 18 for three seasons. Then he moved over uh, to Nice in France for the next couple of years. Now he's coming and he was a spot starter in League One in France. Now he's coming to MLS how what what is the thought we obviously haven't seen him play a minute in mls what what are the feelings are it, there has to be a little bit of excitement even though he's an unknown commodity i mean that that's what you want you want a guy in the prime of his career who played in one of the top div, uh, divisions in the world coming to your team so what's the conversation right now in, in skc camp around remy walter 
Yeah, Peter loves him. He says he's a really technical player. His touch on the ball, his passing ability is is unparalleled. Uh, as I mentioned, they brought him in, even though he traditionally played a number eight, they brought him in really thinking maybe he can challenge Ilya for that number six spot. And I don't think that's out of the question, but it does seem like the more he's been in camp, the more they've seen him, they do like him in that number eight spot. And that's where it gets interesting because now you sort of have four players arguably even five because we haven't talked about Felipe Hernandez, who's another young homegrown who started, I think, eight games last year, made something like 15 appearances, who's also a very solid player and has a bright future. You've got four or five players now who all fit into those dual number eight spots, which, you know, on one hand, you're going to see, okay, who's going to sort of separate and, and really be the consistent starter. But on the other hand, we all know MLS, especially as you get into the summer, a very packed schedule. There's going to be some rotation, especially if SKC qualifies as one of the eight spots for the U.S. Open Cup. Uh, we're not in the Champions League, but I think we're in the the, the League's Cup tournament because they always there's like 47 different MLS tournaments now, and they yeah. keep expanding <laughs> and changing the rules of who's in right. what. But uh, th there's going to be a lot of rotation in the midfield. Another player who had some first uh, league experience in France would be Nicolas Isimat Mirin. So we can move a little bit onto the defense here. He was brought in this offseason, played at uh, PSV Eindhoven for maybe five of the last six years. Before that, he played in uh, Valenciennes in France. I know I know that pronunciation's wrong. It's kind of a running <laughs> joke around uh, around this podcast about how I, I just I just can't do it with names, uh, but <laughs> definitely has some first uh, division experience all over the world. And now he comes to kind of shore up this back line. You have Fontas still there and uh, Punchech, who had his ups and downs of his own this season. And on the wings, you got Dia and Lindsay. So who from this defense is going to take that step up and help this team in the 2021 season? So there's a couple of X factors I would say here. Uh, Lindsay on the right side is there because Graham Zussi is still hurt. If Graham Z Zussi was fully fit, Peter Vermees still loves Zussi. Zussi would probably be the starting right back. He's hurt. Lindsay's shown a lot of promise. He's had some starting experience before. Can he be the full-time starter at the right back spot, which is his natural position? This is his chance, and he has to take it. If he doesn't take it in this opportunity, he's going to start slipping down the depth chart, not only for SKC, but maybe at the national team level because he has some youth national team experience too. So that'll be interesting to watch. And then you mentioned uh, Nicholas Isimat Mirin. I have no idea if I'm saying that right either because they haven't given us a pron pronunciation guide, so we're all guessing. Uh, he's, he's the new center back who's really the Beasler replacement. And Beasler started to get phased out last year. He only played in, I think, 11 games. Uh, Winston Reed, who came over on loan from West Ham, really took over for Beasler last year. Uh, so Ismat Miran will probably be, my guess is he'll actually play in that left center back spot because that's traditionally where Beasler played in Punchech. They had him on the right. Uh, he, he sort of took Ike's spot when, when Ike left to Minnesota. But, but we'll see. Um, Punchech is the more athletic player. Uh, Isamat Mirin, uh, as you mentioned, SKC likes playing out of the back, and, and Beasler was was the passing center back. So can Isamat Mirin step in and fill that role? Because P that's not Punchech's strength. He's not the passer. So uh, if Tim Milia, when, when they're starting to play, he'll look to his left. He always saw Beasler there. He saw Winston Reed last year. Now he's going to see Isamat Mirin. Can Isamat Mirin connect with the midfield or connect with the outside backs and really uh, – start the offensive attack through the the back line that's the question and can they shore up some of those just silly mental errors you mentioned the one <clears throat> excuse me in the san jose playoff game where they gave up that late goal to wando that was like the third time something like that happened to skc last year where they just gave up a silly mental error mistake late in the game it happened against chicago it cost them points throughout the year and it almost cost them a playoff victory so they're gonna have to step up and and really solve those mental mistakes Absolutely. Anything from you, Alex? Yeah, I, I like Jalen uh, Lindsay. Uh, I'm excited about him. I like what I saw last year. I know the, the Minnesota game wasn't exactly, you know, what he brings to the table. I like his athleticism. He reminds me a little bit of Reggie Cannon, to be honest with you. He's got a little athleticism. He's got speed down the center. The way Vermes likes to play with the backs coming up down the wing, creating space. Johnny Russell could cut inside. You yeah, have almost like an extra center forward, giving Polito time. I think it, just like you said, I'm. Re I think he should. You know, I think he's going to be your star all along. I really, really like this kid. I know he's been U.S. On, uh, under 17s. I think he's been involved. He's only going to be, I think, 20 this month or 2021. So the sky's the limit for this kid. And you can see when you see athleticism and the speed, and he likes to go into attack, which is rare for a young American right back. I, I really like this kid. I'm expecting big things from him this year. I love what Sporting Kansas City has put together. I like the roster. I think they are uh, poised for some success this season. Let's just finish up with, with what are our expectations? What do we think 
is this a team that can win MLS Cup? I would say so. What What are your expectations? What would be a, a successful season and what would be a failure season for you? Well, a successful, a successful season for any Peter Vermees coach team is winning trophies. If you don't win a trophy, then Peter Vermees, the team, the players, and even the fans aren't going to consider it a successful season because whether it's MLS Cup or U.S. Open Cup, we're used to winning trophies on a semi-regular basis. It's certainly not every year, but MLS Cup in 2013, um, the 2015 U.S. Open Cup, 2017 U.S. Open Cup. We made it relatively far in CONCACAF Champions League until Monterey smacked us around, but hey, it happens. Uh, th this is a team that plays to win trophies. Now, what are expectations for this year? That's where it gets a little tricky because I have a lot of confidence in the first choice starting 11. The question is the depth. There's a lot of untested depth on this team this year. There's a lot of young homegrowns, especially on the front That's line. Stuff. Wilson Harris is probably the backup striker. He's never played an MLS minute, even though he's a fantastic goal scorer, the youngest to ever score 20 goals in the USL championship. And he had a hat trick in SKC's first uh, preseason game. Can he translate that into MLS action? It's going to be tough to see. So if I'm being honest, I'm going to guess in the West, this is probably, I would say, fifth or sixth place in the West team going into the playoffs. I just, un until they prove that they can play with the best in the West, the Seattles, the LAFCs, the Portlands, uh, and until the young guys prove they can step up and that the depth can hold up, because we all know in MLS you need that depth to be able to hold up in the congested schedule, or until they bring in more depth on the front line and they've been linked to a couple of left wings uh, from, from Europe, there, there's just some hesitancy, I think, amongst the SKC fan base that what happened last year was we played the middle of the pack teams. We were the best of the middle of the pack. And then as soon as we yeah. got to the playoffs and played the actually really good teams, that's sort of where it fell apart. I really like using them for sports book because I feel like they're a very easily predictable team. We know they're, like I said, they're the best of the middle pack. If I see them in a plus or even matchup, I'm picking them to win and I'm going to win money. But once <laughs> they go and play those tougher teams, it, it, to me, they weren't a team that could, that could, hold up to LAFC or, or any, any of the, the top squad. So I really, really like that. And if I pull up my depth chart, if you look right here, you have plenty of depth in the midfield. Even your back line mm -hmm. has some guys. But if Johnny Russell or Shallowy, Kiri Shelton, Alan Polito, any of those guys go down, and it is it gets bare real fast. And then you're starting mm -hmm. guys who we haven't heard of that we haven't really discussed um, in one of those spots. So it yeah. could be trouble, but I, I am optimistic. I think this Sporting Kansas City team is posed for success. They got a striker. I love in MLS, you got to like when you got guys who can distribute the ball and guys who can put the ball in the net. I don't, I don't want to oversimplify the game here, but that that's how you win. So mm -hmm. I, I really like what's going on. I see this team again, uh, maybe fourth, maybe, maybe fourth in the West and, and taking it for a playoff run. If they can stay healthy, that to me is a successful season. Staying out of the training room on on, on you know, the positions all over the field. Yeah, yeah I'm with Bob yeah. in this. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm with Bob in this. I think Kansas City. I think I think even third, second. I mean, I I love Vermes. I love the whole system. I love when you play against Vermes. You don't know what he's going to bring. He could change it up. You're not sure if it's going to be. You know, the counter press, is he going to counter press this time or is he going to pull it back? He, that's the one thing about I love about him. He changes tactics on the fly sometimes versus an opponent. Not a lot of coaches do that. And that's why it, it's always a difficult time when you're playing Sporting Kansas City as an outsider. I mean, when I see Sporting Kansas City on a schedule, I'm like, oh, shit, am I going to get three points out of this? I don't know. You can't mark it up. You know what I mean? So I love – I think I think at least third in the West, if not more. I know you're linked to like – like, I read the other day a left a left winger that's arguably the fastest player on the planet, something like that mm -hmm. I read the other day. Yeah. You sign this guy now. You're now up front. You guys have got even more depth, more dangerous attacking options, especially with that counter press. Polito's going to bang – Right in the eight yard box, boom, boom, boom. You got a 20 goal score. And now you're looking at a top three place in the West. And you, I think you're in for every kind of trophy available that's going to be there. Sporting Kids is right there. I really like your franchise. You're a rock solid organization from ownership, fans, coaching, development, all the way down. You wanted a model franchise in MLS. And it, it, there's nothing to be exciting to be a Sporting Kansas City fan to me as an outsider. Absolutely. Nate, if you guys are watching for the first time, make sure you hit that bell uh, icon and subscribe to our channel. We'd love to hear from you on any of our platforms. That is Twitter, Instagram, everything. You can find us on Facebook at the ID Sports Discussion Group. You can find us at idsports.com, youtube.com backslash ID Sports, and any of your favorite podcast platforms. Now, Jimmy, one last time, give us a, a pitch and let us know what you're working on right now. 
Sure. Check us out at no other pod on Twitter. You can find us on all of the podcasting platforms. Our links are, are in our Twitter bio. Uh, we are on Instagram. We're building that at no other pod. Uh, you can follow me at JC max zero three, my co-host. He's not with us today, but at Dan Couser. Uh, it, we're just two passionate sporting Kansas city fans who like to think we know a little bit of, about the game and, and we just have fun on our podcast. Um, it, it, we get sidetracked, get a little crazy sometimes, but but it's a fun time. So so check us out. Uh, we love talking about uh, any MLS news, U.S. national team news. Uh, we just got a new NWSL team in Kansas City, too, that we're going to be talking about this year. Really excited about that to support the women out here as well, too. So, uh, yeah, come check us out, and we'd be happy to have you. Thank you so much for joining us here today, and thank you for watching ID Sports. 